cloud. Oh, oh. there you go. So um, thank you everybody for joining us for this uh, talk on this uh, uh, pre-IPO fund, which is kind of interesting in the, in the tumultuous times we've had in the last month or so. It's good to have some things which are not really necessarily moving with the market. And uh, what I like about this fund is, is it's a really, there's, there's a lot of companies out there. There's uh, 6 million private companies out in the United States and, and everybody always talks about the market, the market and the market is really, um, the publicly traded market is depending upon your numbers, I've seen 3,500, I've seen 5,000, but somewhere in that range. So um, it's good to have access to some of these other companies that that people don't normally get access to. So I never knew you could get access to companies before they go public in this type of fund, but uh, we've uh, had some clients invest in this, including myself in the last uh, few years, and we've had a good experience. So uh, what we wanted to do is uh, we figured we'd, we would uh, kind of give a, a view as for people who are not in it yet as to what this fund is doing and, and why it might make sense for you. And then, uh, and also for the people who are in it already, to give an overview as to uh, how it's doing for you. So, uh, uh, Kevin, do you want to start uh, presenting and, and talking about the investment? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. My name is Kevin Moss. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Private Shares Fund and one of the portfolio managers. And I've been on a couple of Steve's calls, so may, you might have heard from me before, um, but I, I'd love to give these, these updates, as well as introduce the fund to potentially new investors. Um, what we really were trying to do with this fund, which was started back in March of 2014, so this fund has been around going on eight years now, uh, we were really looking at the, the public space and the private space and trying to ask a few questions. One is, you know, the fact that this whole idea that the, the private sh the private companies are staying private much longer, and there's a capital shift between the public market and the private market. And so what does that mean for the public market investor? The opportunities that you, they used to see in the public space uh, are either no longer there or they're just become limited. Um, because a lot of the growth is not taking place anymore in the public space, it's taking place in the private space. If you turn back the clock of time, 20, 25 years, and Apple and Cisco and some of the other big names that we know today um, were going public, they, they were going public after five years uh, of the, since inception of the company. They had $150 million in revenue. They were growing 50 to 60% top line. And they went public and the public investor obviously could take advantage of that and grow with the company over time. Today, a company with that profile stays private and continues to stay private and grows in the private space. And so the question continue to be like, how do we get access to these companies? Number one, number two, how do we get the non-accredited investor access to these companies because the accredited investor can sometimes get access to these companies because they're, you know, they have the ability to invest in private assets, but the non-accredited investor doesn't have any access. And I think the third major question was how do we provide liquidity uh, to an asset class that really has no liquidity? If you look at traditional private equity and venture, uh, the lockups in those funds are 10 plus years. And so we wanted to give the financial advisor the flexibility to be able to rebalance their client's portfolio or give their client some type of liquidity if, if a life event happened to take place where they're buying a house or they're sending their kids to college, keeping in mind that this is still a long-term investment, but there should be some flexibility in there. Um, we did that uh, by looking at different structures and uh, the structure of the fund was the most important part. If you looked within the 40 Act, which is the oversight of regular mutual funds, you'll find a structure called the closed end interval structure that typically was used for real estate 
or credit or other illiquid asset classes, but never really applied to private equity. And the SEC came up with a structure specifically for illiquid asset classes. Um, we thought, well, this makes a lot of sense because the way the, the closed end interval structure is set up is uh, it operates just like an open end mutual fund. On the way in, you can buy it every day at the end of day NAV, but on the way out, it provides quarterly liquidity. And there's a, there's a cap of 5% on the net assets of the fund. The other in, important element of this is the 40 Act fund. It has the regulatory oversight, so all investors can invest in this fund. What we didn't realize at the time was the other benefits that actually came with it, and that is the ability to invest in private equity, if, if any of you have, you'll know that there's a lot of paperwork, there's the PPM, there's the subdocs, there's the operating agreement, all the things that you would have to review and potentially give to your lawyer to review. We do away with all of that because this is now being structured under the 40 Act and you have a ticker symbol. You just hit a button to buy it. So that was actually revolutionary. And a lot of, a lot of people who have invested in private equity were really happy to see that. Um, the other thing that, that really surprised us with this fund is the level of volatility that comes when you're investing in private equity. You're not subject to being valued at supply and demand, but instead of fair value. So that was, that's the backdrop of the fund, some of the reasons why we really wanted to structure it this way. And it was very experimental when we first launched the fund, um, but we'll take you through kind of what, you know, what has happened over time and where we are today. And so if I just kind of move forward, this is, you know, these are some of the slides that really illustrate what has happened. Uh, back in 1999, the average age of a company was four years old. And before that, maybe sometimes even less. And this really shows you the trend that we have. This is a little outdated. It's actually, you know, still the same 12, 13, 14 years old. These companies are staying private. Why has this happened? I mean, there's a couple right major reasons. Number one, when you went public in the past, the real reason to go public was to raise capital to continue to fund your growth. Um, companies don't have to do that anymore. They, there's plenty of capital to be raised in the public in the private space. I'm sure we've all heard now the multiple billions of dollars that some of these companies are raising. The Ubers of the world, Airbnbs, Airbnbs of the world uh, have raised multiple billions of dollars. SpaceX has raised multiple billions of dollars to fund their growth. So, so you don't really have to go public if you don't want to. Um, and the other reason is regulatory. Uh, there's been regulatory rules that have been put in place that make it easier for companies to stay private longer. And you can, you know, it primarily came out of the Jobs Act back in 2012. But there's a lot of uh, elements within the Jobs Act that made it really easier for a lot of these companies to stay private longer. So as a result, um, Companies aren't, there's no, there's no forcing mechanism for these companies to have to go public. And why would they? Like, look at what, look what's happening to some of the public companies today. You know, it's a tough place to be when it's a volatile environment. Um, and so that was really the trend. The, the opposite side of that is all the capital that was being raised in the private space. Um, the number of unicorns that have been popping up over the years. We started back in 2010 with one, which was Facebook. And that was really what put a lot of these companies in the ability to trade these companies in the secondary market and raise capital on the map is this company, Facebook, now called, of course, Meta. Um, and you see this trend over time, more and more capital has, was raised for these companies at much higher valuations. So a unicorn, as, as I think, maybe you may have known is, is private companies with an enterprise value of a billion dollars or more. It used to be very rare. There was only one of them. So that's why they call it the unicorn. Today, I don't know, they should probably change the name because there's, there's a lot of unicorns these days. Um, but what this really exemplifies is, uh, is the fact that a lot of capital is being raised. A lot of the capital shift we were talking about earlier is happening in the private space. This, this graph right here is, is really trying to illustrate where we are in the life cycle of a company. Um, right here, this is traditional venture. This is not where we are playing. 
traditional venture is, is a couple folks that have a great idea and a slick presentation and they're going around Sand Hill Road to all the top VCs and they're trying to get funding for this great idea and they're getting seed capital. It's a very early stage. There's a lot of technology risk. Um, lot, it's a very high uh, uh, write down profile on this type of company. So this is not where we're operating. However, companies used to go public right here and you would be able to participate in all this growth. That's no longer the case. Um, instead, what we're trying to do is come into a company right in, in this area, right towards the beginning of the small mid cap area and take advantage of these companies that are now no longer early stage, but they've bubbled to the top of the valley. They now have real revenues. They have multiple rounds of financing behind them. They have bubbled to the top of Silicon Valley. And at this point, we wanna take a look at them and say, okay, much safer point to come into. Can we still get some growth out of these companies? Can we still achieve somewhere between a two to three X return on our investment by the time this finally has an exit? And now what we wanna do is come in here and ride the growth of these companies until there's actually an IPO somewhere in here. Once there is an IPO for us in this particular portfolio, we're not gonna exit immediately, um, but we are treating this as a liquidity event. We're not looking at this as the ability to invest in a company. This is basically an exit event for us. And we will begin to exit that position and in, in an unemotional, unemotional um, effective way over a call it three to six month period. And so here again are, are the key benefits that, we're that we were trying to achieve for the financial advisors. A, getting the access, which we think we can do now um, and we've certainly proven over the years, getting that broad exposure, building out a diversified portfolio, uh, get that operational efficiency in place, the liquidity that we were looking for that private equity doesn't really have, and have it be run by experienced managers um, within venture. And that's what we have here in this particular fund. This is a, this is a quick look at our portfolio. And this, this is actually constantly update. Um, and this gives you an idea as to what we're going after. Um, in this particular case, the largest companies are up in the top left corner of the page and get smaller as you go from left to right. So Axiom Space is our largest company in the portfolio, uh, followed by Space, SpaceX, Space Exploration Technologies, SpaceX, the, the, Elon, the Elon Musk um, company, and in this case, Marquetta, although now with an updated uh, uh, slide, which we can get to you guys, Marquetta now has is, is come down because it's a public company and we've been selling it off. Um, but what this should show you is there's probably a lot of companies in here that you'll recognize like SpaceX, um, 23andMe, maybe Robinhood. Uh, those are kind of companies that some people recognize. Uh, Nextdoor might be a company that you actually use. And then there's a lot of companies in here that, that you won't recognize. And, and, we're, and these are the companies that we hope that in two to three years, you're going to know very well. But all of them have that profile that we were referring to, which is late stage venture back companies. These are all companies that are growing 50, 60, 70% top line and have revenues of at least $50 million or more and are heading towards some type of exit. Now, mind you, not all of them are going to be public companies. You know, uh, if you look in the, the history of private companies and how they've exited, about 75% of those companies were actually an M&A exit, not public exit, which we actually really like because an M&A exit is, is pretty clean. It's typically cash. Um, if it's at a premium, obviously, that's great. Uh, there's no lockup periods. Uh, it's very clean in that regard as opposed to the public exit, which today you see a number of ways to hit the public market. You have your traditional IPO, uh, you have your direct listing, which you saw Spotify, Palantir, and a couple other companies do, um, where they're not raising capital, but they're still listing their company in a public forum. And then of course, the proliferation of SPACs that we saw in 2020, 
where a SPAC is targeting a private company um, and taking it public. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of that. And a bunch of our companies have, have been targeted by SPACs um, over the past year and a half. And that's actually been a big advantage for us. And, and there's, some, there's some criticism about the SPAC market. We have the same criticism as everybody else. Uh, but if you have the right SPAC with good sponsors that are targeting companies that actually should be public, you have a good result. And you, we saw that with SoFi, we saw that with ChargePoint in our portfolio, we had very good exits with those kinds of companies. Um, what you're gonna see though, over time with us is an interest in different sectors. Right now, I can tell you, we are very excited about private space economy. Um, Everybody's heard of SpaceX, but you may not have heard of Axiom Space. SpaceX, Axiom Space, uh, we also have Relativity Space. These are all private space companies that are really building the infrastructure for the future of space. Uh, SpaceX, if you think about it, is really the rails to space. Elon Musk is building the rockets. This is how we get there. Axiom Space is building the destination. The current International Space Station is gonna be de decommissioned in 2028. Well, the, there's a lot of private companies that are getting grants from NASA to build private space stations. Axiom Space is one of them, but the difference with Axiom Space is they got a very unique contract. They're actually able to um, connect with the current International Space Station to build out their space station. So super exciting areas, we can talk for a long time about it. And I have a story, as you can imagine, about every company in this portfolio. We're excited about every one. Some of them, though, have the potential to be 10, 15 Xs. Some of them have the potential to be two to three Xs, but we feel a lot safer with them. Um, so really excited. If there's, any, if there's any interest in any particular company, uh, always you know, ask Steve and, and he can direct it back to us and we can always have a conversation with any of those companies. Uh, I'll just comment on this real quick. A lot of people say, how do you, you know, how do you originate these companies? We have a very systematic and organized way of doing it. Uh, we can share this, this slide with you, but you know, we, we, we monitor thousands and thousands of companies. We want to make sure they're backed by the top VCs as a start. We want to make sure that they're later stage in nature to make sure that risk return profile is there that we're looking for. Obviously, we do a, we conduct a deep deep analysis on what you would think are the normal fundamental factors. We look at revenue, we look at growth, we look at the management team, the market potential, uh, and then of course we make that investment decision. There's three portfolio managers. It has to be unanimous and unanimous decision among the three of us, and we don't always agree. You know, we, all, we have different personalities and different likes, so we're not always going to agree on all the companies, but that also provides checks and balances uh, between us, and it also is able to provide key man risk. If any one of us leave or something happens to us, you still have two portfolio managers in place that can continue to run the fund. The big question that we always had when we developed this fund was valuation. And when we went to register the fund with the SEC, it took a year to get this through, through registration. It was probably like six months longer than normal because six months of that was around valuation because the SEC never saw a fund like this before. We're not doing anything unique though here. That we're basically following private equity, gap, stand, gap accounting stand, standard accounting procedures, ASA, ASC 820, which basically measures um, liquidity or va fair value by the, by the amount of liquidity that the asset has. So level one transaction is very liquid and that's like a public company in the portfolio. Uh, it, we don't buy public companies, but if we have a private company that goes public and it's in the portfolio, it's very simple end of day price. We take that in and that's the value of that company. Level two is very straightforward as well. Um, it's if a company raises money and what is that valuation? That's an institutional data point. We take that in. If a company raises capital, we give that 100% weighting 
and that's the value of that company. Level three uh, becomes a little bit more difficult and there's a lot more out valuation inputs that we have to provide. And what a level three input it is, once a company raises capital, well, that valuation gets stale over time. And as it gets staler and staler, the company raised capital a year ago, we have to start relying on other valuation inputs to be able to value that company. Some of those valuation inputs could be uh, public comps, public, public comparables. Uh, where is Fidelity holding SpaceX right now? They issue their public marks every quarter. We're not going to value it there to, the, to, the, to exactly where they're valuing it, but we're going to take it in as an input. Uh, where are companies, comparable companies exiting in the private market? Uh, what are the fundamentals of the company, the financials, all those types of things provide a valuation input and we give them all a weighting, all of which, by the way, the guidance is given to us by uh, KPMG, who's our auditor and has a full audit at the end of every year. Uh, and on top of that, we have an independent board of trustees that are liable for these valuations and we, we meet with them monthly. This slide just illustrates how diversified this portfolio is. Um, FinTech being our largest sector. So companies like Marketa, Funbox, Blend Labs, this was a London company. These are all companies that we're really interested in and have done really well for us. Followed by Aerospace, SpaceX, you know, Axiom, which I just mentioned, um, analytics and big data, that was, a, that's, um, you know, heap and data analytic companies and so forth and so on. And what I think this is really telling you is, you know, we are this, some people look at this and say, this is very, you know, a tech heavy portfolio. But if you look, if you look at this diversification, we have e-commerce, education, ag tech, advertising, you know, healthcare, um, technology today spans all sectors. What all these companies do have in common, common though, is, is innovation. They're innovating and they're, they're being empowered by technology. You know, Lyft and Uber are not really technology companies. They're transportation companies. They're taxi companies, but they're being powered by technology. So those are the kinds of companies that you were going to find in this portfolio. Uh, another really important point, and I know we're running out of time, Steve, but another important point is, is our VC exposure. Every time we look at a company, we want to make sure there's the smartest people that are already invested in it. Um, because we know that Excel, A16, Kleiner, Sequoia, and others have done a ton of due diligence on these companies. Um, they're the early stage investors, and we want to see that they've invested every time this company goes to raise capital. So as you know, what you're seeing here is that all, all of our companies are invested alongside these investors. We have 13 invest uh, companies in the portfolio that have Excel in it. We've got 11 that have IVP in it, nine that A16, which is Andreessen Horowitz. Um, so this makes it a very unique portfolio. Uh, and with the VC investment in there, we know that these companies are gonna have an exit. None of these VCs invest in companies to hang out for years and years and years. They want to make sure that at some point they get their money back. And then finally, uh, you know, I'll end with, um, uh, these are pictures of the portfolio managers, myself, of course, Christian Manoff, who is our chief investment officer, Jonas Grenfis, who's been with us since the very beginning, been with me since the beginning, He's an expert in valuation. Beneath us, we have uh, three analysts. We have got a CFO that has a background in private equity audit. Um, and we also just recently hired somebody that just focus on, focuses on origination because we saw close to a billion dollars in deals last year. And uh, we have to have somebody that really goes after those deals, brings us the best deals and organizes it in such a way that makes it efficient for us to analyze it. So, um, you know, these are the trustees, very experienced individuals, but also, like I said earlier, uh, they are um, 
they are responsible for the valuations. So we have a call with them every single month to go over our fund and go over all the valuations in the portfolio. Um, I'll just say before I turn it over to any questions, Steve, so far this year, um, we're up one and a half percent on the year. What you'll find with this portfolio is we do, we actually do really well in times of financial distress. You know, when the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, we, we were down two and a half percent, not on the year, uh, but just from peak to trough. So when you saw that, that 15 to 20 percent drop in the market, we were down about two and a half percent. And if you look at all the times of financial distress since we started this fund, we've outperformed nine out of 10 times. But more importantly, not only do we out- outperform, but the, the volatility of the NAV is very low. So it feels like when we just had a, a, a 10 to 13% drop in the NASDAQ and some of the other indices that are tech oriented, it just feels better. You know, you can look at this fund and, you know, we've got eight years behind us now. And, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but um, that's how the fund has acted over the past eight, eight years. Uh, so we're up about one and a half percent this year. We deployed a record amount of capital last year, 300 million. We're adding companies all the time, which we think are going to really benefit the fund. We look forward to times of volatility. We don't obviously like our shareholders to be hurting in their public portfolios at all, but it does present a lot of opportunity for this fund because we see valuations come down and we see a lot of price dislocations and we are able to take advantage of it. You know, we, we deploy capital into really good companies at really good prices. And we did that in 2020. We did that back in 2018. And we did that back in 2016 when we saw the market sell off significantly back then as well. So um, Steve, uh, uh, I know we kind of came to our 30 minutes, but I'll I'll open it up to any questions or if you have anything to say as well. Yeah, I I guess the things that I I like are the, the, the parts where you talk about how it moves with the market. And do you have that slide that shows how it did in times when the market went down and, and the performance of the fund. Cause I, I remember that that was an interesting piece that you had over there. Um, yeah, we do have that slide. I don't have it in this presentation, Eric. I don't know if you have that or not a uh, handy or not, but it's um, a, um, but it kind of, and, and then I guess the, the other thing is the, uh, which I find important is the correlation of this to the overall market to show how it moves with the market. I think is right. something else that's important. What's kind of interesting about this fund, which, and I guess the other thing is when sometimes when people look at this um, fund, like the, you know, the last couple of years have been really, really good performance. And the first couple of years performance was kind of like compared to the NASDAQ, you know, kind of, you know, lagging as far as that goes. Um, but do you want to just speak to, I know you've told me that the size and scale of the fund and, and the different opportunities that you've gotten in recently, can you just talk about the, the early stage of the fund versus how it's done in the last couple of years? I think that would be interesting to, to kind yeah, of shed yeah. some light on that. This fund was started with $100,000. You know, it was my, my money and my partner at the time. So when you're starting a fund like this, uh, it's, it takes some time to build out a fund. A lot of private equity funds go out and they raise $200 million. Um, and then they deploy all of it, they raise it all at once and they start deploying capital. <clears throat> this is an evergreen fund. You know, this, we're constantly raising capital over time. So there was a ramp up period, we'll call it three to four years. And if you think about it, every time we invest in a company, we want to invest in a company that's going to have an exit two, three, four years or beyond. So there was a building phase in the beginning um, where you didn't see a lot of activity because we, it was a fairly new portfolio. And so you saw some muted returns up front. But the way to think about this fund is, you know, we're constantly building that bench Um, and that bench was built. And so when we had a really good exit environment, which we saw in 2018, actually for us, we did pretty well. We were only up 6% that year, but we were up more than 10% before the sell-off at the end of the year happened. And I think the market was down five to 10% or more, and we were up 6%. 
Um, and then, but in 2019, you know, explosion in the public market. But guess what? The, the private, the, there wasn't a lot of exits. Um, there wasn't a lot of activity. So we just kept buying companies, um, <clears throat> high quality companies, and really kind of hit um, a critical, a turning point or a critical mass point going to 2020. And we, uh, and you saw a really active public exit environment, which at that point, now we've got a full portfolio. We've got a built out portfolio. And so when all these companies started to exit, we were getting, we were benefiting a lot from that. We never want to be in a position where we're chasing valuation. We want to be in these companies two, three, four years ahead. So when those crazy valuations come, people are coming to us looking to buy our companies and we're actually selling into that. So I think, you know, look, nobody can predict returns, um, but 2020, we did 24%, 2021, we did another 24%. Um, I think what you're gonna find now is over time, what really what this portfolio was meant to do is return 15 to 20% annualized over a long period of time. We're not gonna have, you know, 24% years every year, but you will find that we are going to be uncorrelated with the public market. We're going to march to the beat of our own drum. And we're not in building mode anymore. We're constantly building the bench, but we're not ramping up anymore. You know, we're in 88 companies right now. Right. Um, so that's that's kind of an explanation, Steve. Um, can you just describe to people uh, how you get access to these companies that you normally, the average person couldn't get couldn't invest in SpaceX. How does your company get access to those companies? Yeah, you know, some people, uh, you know, they think you can kind of show up on Sand Hill Road with a bag of money and be like, hey, you know, I want to invest in, in these companies. And it just doesn't work that way. Um, money does not necessarily give you entree to these companies. You really have to have a good line into the VC community, which is what we do. We're out here. We know all the VCs. Um, you have to know the players. You have to know the board members. You have to know the companies themselves and the, the C-suite of all these companies. Uh, you have to show that you're, you're, you know, have um, a good track record of, of investing and you're a good investor, you know, meaning you can help with liquidity for the company, you can help strategically. Um, it's not just about cash. Now, cash does help if you're a good investor. We have a really nice checkbook right now. So as we scaled up and our check sizes got bigger and bigger, we got access to more and more companies. So for example, I tried to get into SpaceX for probably you know the first four years of the fund and, and they said no. You need $10 million. So when I finally got to that level, and he knew me now very well, the CFO of SpaceX, we were able to get in because I could cut that check. There's just some companies you just can't get in without the cash, but you have to be able to you know, really have the connections and the line in to be able to get to these companies. We see deal flow from all the brokers out there. We get a, a call from the bankers, you know, the Goldman's of the world will call us as well. Uh, we get the call from the VC community and we get the call directly from our company. We have 88 companies in the portfolio. If a company is in our portfolio that's raising capital, we're already investors. They're going to be calling us and say, hey, do you want to participate in this, in this round of finance? Um, and in some cases, some of these companies that grow over time, like for example, Fundbox is a company, it's a fintech company. It's a lending company. And they've done extremely well. Um, you know, three years ago, a lot of people could have probably gotten into their their B round, uh, their the D round that they recently raised. <clears throat> you can't get into it, but we could because we were already investors, and they knew who we were. So those are some of the ways, uh, Steve, that we that we get in. Okay, uh, I guess I don't want to ask all the questions. You don't want to, let's just see if there's anybody else wants to unmute themselves and ask some questions, so feel free and 
I'll interject if there's no other questions. Hey, Steve, this is, this is Brian. How you doing? Hey, Brian. Brian. Um, so I was just curious how much of the fund is in cash? Because um, I'm assuming you're, you deploy cash and then as people are buying into the fund, like, is it just sitting there waiting for the next investment or are you adding to any of the existing investments? But uh, what percentage generally is in cash? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, we have run historically somewhere between 10 to 12 percent in cash. Um, and if you look at our fund at any time, if you look at our filings, you're going to see a much higher cash figure, which is a little misleading. For one, uh, we're required to hold 5% in cash to the side anyway by the SEC to meet redemptions every quarter. So that we'll always have 5% in cash, no matter what. Um, and then if we hit a period of volatility, like we saw in 2020 and a little bit right now, sometimes we want to keep two quarters uh, put aside, but, but even still, we always want to keep an extra 5% just to keep some dry powder because you never know if there's a compelling opportunity that comes down. We don't want to be in a position where we're keeping that initial 5% aside. And then we see something very compelling and we can't participate. Um, but what happens is, is this is an unleveraged fund. So, uh, we don't ever borrow money to buy any of these names. It's unleveraged fund. And so as a result, if you look at the companies and the actual transactions, it takes 30 days to buy, you know, 30 to 60 days to buy these companies. So we enter though into the transaction on day one and we put that money aside. So even though you see a high cash pile, sometimes you've seen a high as, uh, as 20 or 30%. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of that cash is spoken for. It's, it's deals in process. And that price is locked in day one. So if anything happens from day one to day 30 or day 60 with that company, meaning maybe they raise some money at a higher valuation or anything like that, we're locked in with that lower price with the, with the seller. So that money will be working, that, that it'll be working for us. But, yeah, but I, hopefully I, that answers your question, Brian. Yep, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the point about uh, the 5% of the outstanding shares, I think that's also what makes this unique. I think a lot of, a lot of other types of pre-IPO type things, if you invested in some of these funds, you, you would kind of be stuck there for a long, long time. But, but uh, what's really interesting about this fund is it, it really is something that can be put in, in you know, clients' portfolios. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread, but let's say I usually <laughs> put 5% in, uh, of clients' portfolios in here, um, but the fact is, if some if we want to get out of it every quarter, there is that liquidity, you know, by up, up to five percent of the outstanding uh, <clears throat> shares in there. So you, you have the ability to do that, and they're, I guess they're literally keeping five percent aside for that redemption, which which is <laughs> it's right there for you. So um, yeah, yeah. can you want to just describe as to whether there's been a, ever been a problem in people getting their money out of the fund? Yeah, so the fund's been around for eight years. <clears throat> if if we, and just to be clear, it's 5% in net assets of the fund. So $100 million in the fund, we put aside $5 million. If $5 million or less is requested, everybody gets a full redemption. If $6 million or 6% of the fund is requested for to be redeemed, we still only give 5% out, back, out, but it's pro rata. So, so you'll get, you know, your pro rata amount. Uh, in the history of the fund, and we're talking about, um, you know, 32 quarters approximately, we've breached that 5% three times. Um, <clears throat> the first time was back in 2019 for a variety of reasons. And we returned... 92 cents on the dollar. So if you're trying to get $100 out, you basically get $92, $92 out, um, which means that the balance is still in the fund. So it's not like you lose it or anything it's back in the fund. If you want to get the rest out, you can try for the following quarter. That's still very liquid if you think about private equity, because if you're in regular private equity, you can't get anything out. So you're still getting a decent amount out. The following quarter, there was no proration. So basically took 
uh, for that one particular moment in time, it took two quarters to get a full redemption. Um, and then the two other times it happened was in 2020, right when the pandemic hit was, was our redemption day. So the timing wasn't great, but we still returned 43 cents on the dollar right in March of the pandemic. Um, by the time we got to the second quarter, we returned 92 cents on the dollar. So, and a lot of people who wanted to redeem in the first quarter ended up canceling the redemptions because things had started turning around. Um, and then the third quarter, everybody got out what they wanted. Um, and so the point here is in 32 quarters, anybody who's wanted a full redemption got a full redemption within two quarters. Two quarters one time, one quarter the other time. Other than that, we've, we've never really had an issue. We usually come in of the 5%, we usually come in around two to 3%. Um, and that's been fairly normal. The last year and a half has been below that. So there really hasn't been a lot of redemptions. <clears throat> Anybody else have any other questions? Steve? Yes. Is there a, a minimal investment for individual investors or does Steve have to muster a sum of money among all of his investors that gets him at a certain minimum to come in? There is a $2,500 minimum investment, which is, you know, we talk about a lot of advantages to this fund. You can't put $2,500 into a private equity fund, as you can imagine. Right. Um, but with this fund, you can invest with as little as $2,500. So Steve could put that in on anybody's behalf. Uh, it does not have to be some minimum amount that he aggregates among his clients. It, it just okay. it requires a fair amount of paperwork. So I'm probably not doing any $2,500 investments just to state that for the recording right now. So, but um, yeah, that, that is the absolute minimum, I guess, for that. Anybody else have any other questions? So what I, do you wanna just tell a few stories about some of the investments in there just to give people a flavor about some of the more interesting names that are in there and things that people never heard about so they can get an idea as to, you know, really what they're getting access to? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've got hundreds of stories, of course, but, you know, one, a few that, that stand out. Obviously the SpaceX story, you know, $10 million investment, um, I had to, is an unusual company, like it's one of the few companies that actually interviews you to, to, to actually be, get onto the cap table. So I had to go to their headquarters, which was pretty amazing. If you've ever been to SpaceX headquarters, it's astounding actually. Um, and it's like getting into Fort Knox, a lot of security. Um, bumped into Elon Musk on my way to the office while I was while I was walking through their hallways to get to the office. And then I get interviewed by the CFO and a couple other people. Um, and it was kind of scary actually, because there's some, there was lots of security, lots of security in there. Uh, but that's what it took to get onto the cap table of SpaceX. You know, it's to, to, I had to fly down to Southern California and visit their offices and, and get in there. But since that investment, it's already tripled in valuation and it's been a great investment. Um, you know, we invested, started investing in fintech in early 2015, 16 with SoFi and Marketa. Um, and Marketa was a company that nobody was really paying attention to, but they were really powering the technology behind a lot of the payment companies that you see today, like Square and PayPal and others. And we bought it for like a buck fifty, a dollar fifty. You know that was the pricing on it. Um, it went as high as forty dollars in the private space, and traded as high as twenty, you know, uh, thirty-five dollars when it had a public exit. And so it's companies like that um, that that really power some of our returns. You know, we and you can imagine if today I invested ten million dollars and I had a twenty x, like I did with 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 with. Marketa, that's $200 million uh, in PL. And 
no matter how big this fund is, a billion dollars, $2 billion, you're talking about 10, 20% return just in NAV. You know, Marquetta probably added about four to 5% of return to our, to our NAV in our move in 2020 and 2021. So there are companies in there like that, that can really be upsized. And then we've got some companies like Pubmatic, which was an ad tech company, which kind of was a dead sector for a while. Um, nobody was really paying attention to it. We were building our position. They were executing on everything they said. They were doing all the things right. And again, finally, when the, when the public market opened up and suddenly they were putting a multiple much higher than they did in the past on ad tech companies. PubMatic took that opportunity to go public and it went from a $2 million position in the portfolio to about an $18 million position in the portfolio very quickly. So those are the kind of companies uh, that we're investing in. You know, Grub Market is really interesting. This is, this is basically food technology. They're doing some really unique things. Um, relativity space is also in the private space economy. They're digital, digitally basically creating rocket parts. Um, when you invest in these kinds of companies with the innovation that is involved, you're seeing things that you never thought could ever happen. It's sort of like the Jetsons type of world that we live in now. Um, that's really what's here. And these are things that are happening today, not necessarily that are happening years from, from now. Um, so the fun thing about this portfolio is you're investing in all these really cool technologies. There's a company that we're looking at right now, which basically, um, and it's not in the portfolio yet, but we're looking at it and it's just such a cool technology. It, it's, it, it, it gets put in your car and it makes, there's no shock. There's no shocks. There's nothing. You can't feel anything. It feels like you're sitting in your living room. And, and there's, there's a lot of technology behind it and a lot of things go, go into it. Um, but they're already getting hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts from cars around the world. And the VC community is trying to get into this company um, because of just that. It just basically creates an absolutely still environment within your car. So it's just fun to, to invest. It's fun to talk about and if you get exposure to these companies, as you can see, the way this portfolio has acted over, over the years, it feels kind of safe. It's been very stable. You know, anything can happen, but it feels very stable. It has been for eight years. Um, and it's and the returns are, you know, have been doing pretty well. Yeah, it's it's what's crazy. What when I when I first was hesitant about this portfolio, because it seems like I guess you would describe these companies as disruptive technologies that, that they don't really have a whole lot of earnings to start where they're growing tremendously. So you would think that they would be somewhat speculative, I guess, but I guess the experience I've had is it really, it actually has been like a lot steadier than I would have thought with that then too. Do you want to just maybe that's, speak to that? Yeah, that's obviously that's the perception, you know, venture comes with high risk and it does like early, like traditional venture. A lot of these companies go to zero, but we're not, we're not investing in that space. We're investing in the later stage space um, these companies that we're investing in are making a lot of money. Uh, they're not showing a profit yet because they're taking all the money that they make and putting it back into growth and marketing. And so, so the investment is in, in their growth. There's a lot of companies in our portfolio. If they wanted to show profitability, they can pull lots of levers that allow them to show profitability, but then they're pulling back on spend and, and, and all the things that, that make them grow significantly. Um, so the perception is, is, is high risk um, and failure in a lot of these companies. But the reality is, is a lot of these companies aren't failing. Um, if we're doing our jobs right, we're picking a lot of the good companies. You're going to get some failures. You're, you know, we're not perfect. You're definitely going to get some failures along the way. But if we construct the portfolio properly, um, then the one or two failures that we're having or the un underperformers aren't going to outweigh the outperformers. And the volatility as a result has been very low over the, over the years. You're not subject to a short attack in your company. You're not subject to an analyst coming out and saying, you know, downgrading your company. You're not subject to an institution just 
dumping the company on the market and causing the price to go down. It just doesn't happen in the private market. So as a result, it doesn't move around that much, which is nice. Um, today, we value a company at, at XYZ. Just because the market fell 5% today, that doesn't necessarily mean that our company that's valued at XYZ is doing anything wrong. Like they're still, they're still executing uh, their... Uh, you know, what they told us they would execute, they're still generating the same amount of revenue, they're still growing the same amount. So ASC 820 says you still value it here. The thing that can bring it down is, is some of the valuation inputs. So there is a public comp input in there, a public comparable. So if the market's coming down, you could see a pull down in valuation in some of our companies. But a lot of time that's offset by other things that are positive. As, again, as a result, there's a lot of stability in there. How, how often do you reposition? Like, is there, if a company's not performing, do you kick it out of the portfolio? How often do you do that? Or pretty much when you pick a company, does it stick with you guys for the duration? Um, you know, it usually sticks with us for the duration. We, we certainly won't add to it. If a company goes wrong, we'd like to try to get rid of it. But it's pretty tough in the private space because a lot of people know that something's wrong with it. Um, but as the fund grows over time, it just gets more and more diluted in the portfolio so that by the time it actually does come out, it doesn't really have a material effect on the portfolio or the NAV or the performance. Um, it will come out eventually by some means, but sometimes it takes some time. And, and if it's not doing well, again, we'll try to get out of it. But if we can't, we just let it sit there. So when you look at the portfolio, when you say you're going to get whatever you said, the 15 to 20%, you know, a year. So you, I guess I'm assuming that you have certain companies you're assuming you'll get whatever, you know, your 20 times multiple and some companies you'll get your two or three times multiple. And I guess you have to assume there'll be a couple of companies that just won't make it. You'll get zero on your money, but I guess that's how you came out with that 15 to 20%. Yeah. That's basically how we, you know, we, we look at it. That's, that's just a goal, you know, obviously, um, we don't have a crystal ball, but that's what we'd like to return over. Uh, we'd like to return 15 to 20% over a five plus year time horizon with the volatility that comes with the portfolio. So on a relative basis, we're, we're way outperforming, mm -hmm. but on an absolute basis, we're still, I think, outperforming, but, um, but doing it in a way that also has a lot of stability um, you'll see many times in the portfolio when there's a big red day in the public market that people look at our 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 price of our you've seen it Steve like we're just we're down like I don't know five cents sometimes we're up you know there's just not a lot of correlation there and how soon when a company goes public are you do you get rid of it is it a certain requirement to get rid of it in 30 days or 60 days or or just mm -hmm. whenever no requirements, but you know, again, we're not in the business of holding public companies. So we just want to get out of it, lock in those returns. Um, and frankly, if, if we're locking returns, it will make a distribution at the end of the year to our shareholders as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no set time, but we'll usually get out somewhere between after a company comes out of lockup, which is usually six months after it goes public, we'll get out somewhere between 30 to 60 days after that. Okay. Well, I don't want to ask all the questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? I have one question, Steve. Uh, Kevin, this is Larry. Uh, I noticed in your portfolio, uh, way down the bottom, you had clean energy. And um, it, it, I was, it was just curious to me that it was such a small portion of the portfolio. And is that is that a case of too late to dance or, or can you just comment on that? Yeah, we actually had a, uh, a good allocation of clean energy back in 2015 and 16, and it did not perform well for us. You know, that's a good case of, we took our lumps in clean energy um, and we were invested in Sunrun uh, and a company called Sungevity and a company called Clean Power Finance or Spruce Finance. Uh, Sunrun 
went public and you know we ended up taking a small loss on it only to look at it two years later and it went up like 700 percent but we're we're not you know again we're not in the business of holding public companies so that was painful but the other two companies went to zero you know when the trump administration came in um unfortunately there was this perception that he was going to like really hurt all the clean energy. And because these companies are capital intensive, they relied heavily on um, lines of credit. And all those lines of credit got shut down. And, and these companies went to zero pretty quick. So we, we learned from that. Um, but that, and it's not like we won't invest in clean energy because we, we, still, we still would, but we're just kind of careful with that, Larry. Anybody else have any other questions? Well, I guess that's uh, that's enough about pre-IPO investments. But I think it's you know I, I think it's it's uh, you've done well for my clients, so I uh, commend you for that. And uh, you know we actually this is going to be recorded, so you know I guess you you want to put in your caveats in there about uh, what do you have to say that the past performance is not reflective of future yeah. results or something like that but yeah. um but you guys have done a good job so far so keep up the good work and i think it's an interesting opportunity do you, you just want to one other thing is do you want to just talk about how many private companies are out there and and the opportunity because the actual statistics is it like six million private companies and how many publicly traded companies and you know why you know the market might be expensive but maybe why this might not be that expensive and i'll just let you close with that yeah, I mean, the public market has been basically cut in half. There used to be approximately 9,000 traded companies, and I think now it's down to 4,500. Um, there's there's multiple, I'd say, I wouldn't say, I don't think it's 6 million, but there, I mean, it depends on what you're looking at, Steve. Like, there's probably, there's, there's many millions of private companies, but companies that fall within the profile we're looking at, um, you know, call it hundreds of thousands of companies, uh, close to a million. And, um, and that continues to grow because all the capital that's being invested in these companies. Uh, the valuations are something that we need to be careful of because we've seen valuations inflate. And so we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, and those are actually coming down right now with the volatility we're seeing in the public market. But the one thing I would say is you can't time a market like this. You know, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs. Um, you don't know when they're going to come. You want to take advantage of the downs and the ups. And you always want to be building that bench so that when you get the ups, you're in there. You're not chasing valuations. And when you get the downs, you're in there too. You take a few lumps, but you're also really looking forward to those downs because that's the time to deploy capital. Some of the best vintages in the history of venture were the worst periods, in, uh, unfortunately, in our markets, 2008, 2009, were the best vintages. Um, 2018 was a really good vintage. 2016 was a really good vintage. That's why we were up 24% in 2020 and 2021, because of the companies that we bought in 2018 and then in 2016. Right. You know? So, so you still see, I guess, to, to, to summarize, you still see it, it's a good time to invest in the fund and there's there's still good valuations out there and the opportunity with, with the publicly traded market having its lumps in the first month of January, I guess the opportunities are better than they were, you know, like you said, in August of last year. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a fund that you want to stay invested in. You want to... Um, Try not to time it because it's it's just impossible. Um, we're not always going to have twenty four percent years, uh, but but you should remember that during those periods of time when we're having you know dip, double digit returns in the teens or even below, we've actually never had a down year before. I hate to say that now, uh, but we never have, and we're constantly building that bench. You just have to be in it because a lot of people try to get into the fund 
once it started taking off and, and try to capture returns, it's too late, you know, um, in terms of capturing those returns. You'll capture future returns. So I just encourage people, you know, don't try to time it. If it's not a good time for you to invest, that's fine. But just don't try to time it because you just never know uh, when the fund is going to really perform. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much um, for this uh, session we've had over here. Um, this uh, this session is being recorded. So if you think somebody else might have an interest in listening to this, the recording should be available sometime next week. Um, I also did my seminar last week on the uh, retirement seminar. That's also being recorded. And then uh, I did not hit the record button on my guide to the markets uh, that last Wednesday. So I'm doing another session on that um, in a couple of weeks. So just look for that. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I will, uh, I'll end it here, unless you have anything else to say there, Kevin. Uh, we'll end it here, and then we'll, uh, we'll carry on. And anybody has any questions, uh, just feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Bye. Kevin. Thank you.